Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, great to have uh, you guys uh, joining us in our uh, USD rates and credit outlook. Uh, I'm Timur Baik, uh, Group Researcher's Chief Economist. I'm here with me, uh, credit and uh, FX strategist, Kang Will Young. Hi, Will Young. Hi, everyone. And our senior rate strategist, Eugene Liao. Hey, Eugene. Yeah, hi, 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 everyone. So we will divide the webinar up into three parts. First part would be Eugene talking about the Gavi's uh, strategy. Uh, then it would be Will Young talking about both on the rate set, but today his real focus is on the credit strategy. Uh, and then we will take some questions from you. This is a WebEx call. At the bottom right corner of the screen, we have a little chat box. I've already posted a welcome message there, so feel free to write down your questions there or comments there. I'll keep an eye on them as uh, Eugene and William speak, and uh, we will take them on during or at the end of the uh, seminar. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, we already have the presentation on the screen. Uh, Eugene, all yours. Thanks very much, Timer. So you're currently at a stage uh, in the cycle uh, where things are very volatile and twists can come, and they come multiple times a year. So I'll kick off by taking us through what our latest thoughts are on dollar rates and the strategies around it. So where we are now, uh, we think that tightening has stopped. Uh, I think it is now obvious to most market participants that that is the case for the Fed and for the most part of the G10 economies. It was not that obvious when we made the call back in July that the Fed is done. Right, and then uh, that marks the end of very aggressive uh, tightening that kicked off in 2022. So with all that aggressive tightening, uh, we have a lot of worries about recession over the past five quarters. But all these recession worries turned out to be too early, premature, and what we had instead was economic resilience, uh, despite so much tightening. Right, and if you look at the data, it is displaying just that. The unemployment rate is still below 4% in the US. Uh, and if we think that the neutral unemployment rate is closer to 4.5, then the labor market is still fairly tight. And on the inflation front, we had inflation close to 9% last year, and that has since drifted lower towards 3%. So the mix of growth, inflation, employment is looking much more positive. Right. Growth is still holding okay, the unemployment rate is fine, but inflation is much lower. So this is closer to Goldilocks. It is no longer overheating. So this is where we are now. And if we look into 2024, what should we expect? Right. So another thing that's been debated a lot is cuts. Right. They've been debated since the end of last year, early this year. Uh, but again, it does not seem to be coming that soon. Right, so we, we have pencil in cuts, uh, four cuts in the second half of next year. And uh, we think this is consistent with our view of a soft landing. All right, and soft landing will require signs of slowdown. Right? It requires more meaningful signs. And that would take, uh, say, CPI clearly below 3% for some time. And an unemployment rate perhaps closer to 4.5%. Right? So it is difficult to see imminent Fed cuts unless we see a crisis unfolding, uh, similar to what we saw in uh, March, April, where a series of banks failed. Right? So cuts are coming, but probably not that soon. Now, the amount of tightening that's been done in this cycle has been quite unprecedented. Right? So if we look at the comparison, we've delivered 525 basis points of hikes over a very short time period for the Fed. And you've compared that to the last three Fed hike cycles, it is by far the most delivered and also the shortest time delivered. Right? So we think this part of the cycle is probably already done. Uh, now, what about on the QT side, right? because there's also the balance sheet and liquidity to consider. So on the right side, I have put in the balance sheet changes for Fed, ECB, and the BOJ. And what you notice that is that a lot of the bars the black bars, which are for the Fed, have been in negative territory. And that makes sense because it's been running QT for some time and the balance sheet is shrinking. Mm, it gets a bit more complex when we consider the ECB because they run the LTROs and these tend to be more lumpy in nature. So when, when that instrument does not roll, 
uh, there's a big drop in the balance sheet. But by and large, the trajectory is the same for both the Fed and the ECB, and that their balance sheets are shrinking. Now for the BOJ, there's another layer of complexity that comes with the yield curve target and yield curve cap. Because if they have to defend the cap, then they have to purchase some assets. Right? So in, in, in this case, uh, you notice that the BOJ has been expanding its balance sheet uh, for many months in, in 2023. Right, if, even though it is trying to get less loose in terms of policy making. So has anything changed? Right? So if you look at the, the rally in the US treasuries and, and the other governments in the DM space. Uh, Eugene, just yes. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Just go back to the previous slide for a second. Uh, I think for everybody present, you know, would be sort of jarred by that big bar of the Fed uh, in February, March, the big jump. Uh, which sort of, you know, overturned the trend for a while. Uh, so I think two things. One is just remind us why they did that. And secondly, net net, they still have been shrinking the balance sheet, right? Uh, yes, correct. So on the whole, they have been. And the issue with the big spike uh, in March was because there was the banking crisis and the Fed was uh, prompted to provide liquidity to, to the banks that need them. So this was a crisis uh, level play to try and soothe financial conditions that were threatening to get out of hand. And back then, it's not just the discount facility that got used. There was also the BTFP that got introduced. So all these served to soothe nerves and allowed us to move from a period where recession was the most likely scenario back in March, April, into a period where, hey, things are actually okay and we started climbing uh, rapidly towards the middle of the year. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's not that straightforward this year. So even as we navigate through the different scenarios, uh, it's we've priced in many types of scenarios in, in just the first half of this year alone. Right. So so what has changed more recently over the past five weeks? Right. So I, I see two things. Uh, first is that the Fed left the policy settings unchanged for the second street uh, meeting, and then you look you look at the statement. Uh, it is clear that there are worries that of tight financial and credit conditions and how that might weigh on economic activity going forward. And looking at Powell's comments. Uh, it's clearly a, a lot more caution. Uh, so the focus has at least shifted towards something more balanced. And we think that this shift is probably more durable than the other perceived shifts that we saw over the past four quarters or so. So for the Fed and for market participants, the view is that the Fed is clearly a lot more cautious after hiking by so much. Uh, in such a short time. Now, the second thing that has changed is that because of uh, better than expected revenue collections, and that is a one-off, uh, the amount of uh, issuances that got scheduled for 4Q, uh, it's a lot lower than estimated. Now, this provides relief, right? And then there's also the icing on the cake when the issuances are tilted somewhat towards the shorter tenants at a time when people were very worried about uh, term premium and who's going to buy all the extra issuances. So there's some relief for now, uh, but if you look at the 1Q estimates, the issuances are going to jump right back up. Right? So these are the two key things that have shifted uh, over the past uh, five weeks or so. And I think market participants have caught on and there's a sizable move lower in DM rates uh, just over the past month or so. So even as we discussed the rates and then QT, and we know that the rates front we're probably already done, right? The debate is just shifting to, okay, at what point will data weaken enough for cuts to materialize? Now on QT, uh, when we look across Fed, ECB and BOJ, in general, all three have plenty of excess liquidity left. So in, in this presentation, I'm just gonna talk about estimated excess dollar liquidity in the US system. Right, so we think there's about two trillion left, and that is down from close to four trillion uh, towards the end of 2021. Right? So yes, there's been a substantial drop. Right, so can this go further? And the answer again is yes. Right, the reverse repo facility still has close to 900 billion US dollars, and that can be drained close to zero. Note that before the pandemic started, the RRP was hardly used. The figure was zero. And so even if that gets drained down to zero, we still have to contend with 
estimated access reserves. Right? So we think that QT can run for another year. Uh, there might be more caution when we get into 4Q24, where the QT pace might have to slow. Uh, but I think we are still quite far away from there. So with the Fed having changed tech, uh, how should we view this? Right. So we've been in the Goldilocks camp for quite a few months. Uh, so we look at financial conditions. So that will be represented by the grey line. If it is high, it means the stocks are doing well, credit spreads are tight, and the dollar, dollar tends to be weak. So that's a typical risk on environment. And if it is low, the converse is also true. So for this cycle is that the whole bout of volatility or the multiple bouts of volatility are purely generated by the Fed, right? If you hike very aggressively, as represented by the red bars, 75 basis, 75 basis, you add a lot of stress into the market. And when that happens, they give go risk off, right? And as these hikes taper off, 75 basis, 50, 25 into a skip, uh, financial conditions broadly improved. Now, within this broad cycle and shift, there are also little squiggles. And the little squiggle that comes over the past few weeks, again, is from the two shifts that we saw uh, on the Fed becoming more neutral and on the issuance front becoming more palatable, at least for a while. And if you look at the performance of the IG high yield spreads, uh, they've tightened a lot. VIX move, implied volatility generally has fallen, and the S&P 500 has had a nice bump. And the dollar has weakened. All these are classic risk on signs. So implied volatility shows something similar. So we just focus on the red bar, which is the one one month ten years option. So that's the implied vol there. And at the start of the hike cycle, uh, you notice that vols are very high across stocks, FX, and rates. Right, and it's driven by the rates fall because the Fed is trying to engineer a landing. But as we shift into this year, you notice that things have diverged. Uh, while rates fall have been elevated over the past three quarters or so, uh, the, you look at the VIX and the FX uh, implied vols, they seem to have decoupled. Right? So, so as the Fed eased off on, on aggressive hikes, uh, it seems that there's a bit of decoupling across the different asset classes as well. And more recently, as implied vols for rates fell, there was an outsized move in the VIX as well. Right? So, so a bit of decoupling as, as the Fed starts to fade into the background. And having discussed the different parts of the markets and policy making, what about the expansion that we are currently experiencing? So UX expansions, the table on the left shows you all the expansions from 1949 to where we are now. On average, each, each expansion lasts about 66 months. The current expansion is about 41, 42 months. All right, so we're not quite at the old age of expansion, uh, but we, are, we will hit close to the average uh, in another year or so. And the average itself does not give us a very good gauge on whether the expansion can last or will be cut short because there are expansions that last above 100 months. And in times of volatility, say in the 70s, the cycles can be a little bit short. So this is something to watch out for, uh, that each cycle will age. And we are probably hitting into the uh, middle, middle age portion of this expansion already. In terms of recession probabilities on the chart on the right, the market was really pessimistic uh, in June, right? When the curve was deeply inverted and the odds of a recession over the coming year at that point was close to 60%. But as the curve uninvert, uh, we got the, the odds of recession has since fallen to about 40%. So if you look at all these market and then data and odds, and it seems that we are on the glide path lower. And if we look at the Fed projections and what the market is pricing in, we think it is broadly appropriate. There's about four cuts priced into markets for next year. And that is uh, in line with our forecast uh, for 400 basis points of cuts in the second half of next year. The market is perhaps a little bit more aggressive than us. Uh, 
uh, there's a even odds of a cut by March and a full cut priced in by May, right? So the market has gone from pricing in only two cuts in 2024, just one month plus ago, to now pricing in four cuts and earlier than what we thought, uh, what we have put in in our forecast, right? So there are, there are large swings in these expectations. Now, what about the 10-year yield? Right. So again, uh, there's been a big spike uh, in, in yields. So 10-year yields actually hit our target of 5% before pulling back. Uh, we think that yields in the range of 4.5 to 5 represents very strong growth. And we were definitely there to treat you. If you look at the, the GDP numbers and the totality of US data, it is still very, very firm. Now, as we slip into a period of moderate growth, uh, we should see yields come off and say perhaps be in the range of 38 to 4.5%. To go below that will probably require much a much slower growth than what we currently expect. Right? So that would be closer to a hard landing. Uh, we don't think we'll get there. So it's not just the US. If you look across the G10, uh, with the exceptions of uh, Japan and, and Aussie, all the other major central banks have cuts priced over the next year. So if you look at the rate bars, they're all negative. So broadly, if you have been embarking on very aggressive rate hiking cycle this year, then there will be a lot more cuts priced. Now, conversely, if you have been less hawkish, say like the RBA, then it makes sense that the RBA may not have to cut that soon or that aggressively because policy settings are just not that tight. Now, the BOJ bucks the trend. Uh, it is understandable that the BOJ has been glacial in this uh, cycle. Uh, it needs to make sure that the balance sheet of the banks are okay. It also needs to make sure that uh, inflation uh, is seen to be more, more entrenched rather than jumping the gun. And if you look at the market pricing as well, uh, it is the only central bank within the G10 where the market sees uh, further tightening coming over the next one, two years. So we have run through all four scenarios, right? The different permutations of uh, growth and inflation uh, this year. We kicked off the year with stagflation, uh, inflated, uh, very inverted curves, uh, recession worries and high inflation, right? So that stayed for a while before we lurched into the banking crisis where Fed cuts are seen to be imminent. Uh, that faded towards the middle of the year, and then we drifted towards the top left-hand quadrant where hey, growth is fine, inflation is high, and then we get all the rate hike bets uh, getting added up, and then all the fading of rate cut bets uh, kicking in. So that went all the way up to about uh, one month ago, and then now we are slipping somewhere into the bottom left quadrant where uh, we are in the golden ox, where growth is still okay, uh, inflation is coming off. And this probably leads to more stable use and steeper curves. As this recovery ages, we will probably go towards the bottom left, bottom right quadrant. Uh, and if it is a soft landing, uh, then we should see steeper curves and uh, modesty lower rates. So this will be my last slide uh, before I hand over to to Wei Liang. And as mentioned, soft landing Goldilocks is something that we've talked about for quite a few months. Uh, and that should translate into steeper curves and slightly lower rates, and some of which have already been playing out. And for risk, it is positive. Right? So the risk at this point, to our view, it's fairly balanced on both ends. So if we have the looser financial conditions starting to support the US economy, and or the Chinese economy turns around over the next few quarters, uh, we might see a case of uh, rates taking another leg higher. And on this run, we are not clear this would be supportive of risk. It would probably be risk neutral. Now on the downside, there have been worries about the US banking sector. Uh, this could surface again, right? The, the, the weaknesses are still there. And uh, it could well be that high rates bite hard with a much longer lag than what many people anticipate and when 
this hits again, uh, it could be a much harder landing than what many market participants are looking at. And should this play out, it will be much deeper curves uh, with the two year collapsing very fast, right? So that would be risk negative. Right, so I'll just uh, pause here. Uh, William, would you like to take over? Uh, wait, wait, before yeah. William comes in, uh, here's yeah. a couple of questions for you. Yeah. Um, we are releasing our China outlook tomorrow. And one of the key discussion points in China is that would a Fed pause or a rate cut in 2024 make it easier for PBOC to entertain an easier policy? Uh, and would it still mean that we can be constructive China fixed income, but at the same time, not worry too much about uh, RMB because the pressure on the RMB was this year. Next year would be one where because of fake pause or rate cuts, you can go ahead and cut rates, but not worry about the RMB. What's your view on this thesis? Yeah, I think broadly for all, all uh, economies, it's not, not just China, right? China is just facing all the same global issues that we are facing, that high uh, US rates and the strong dollar is placing considerable pressure on currencies and on external front. So so we have that fading and that is undeniably a positive and will give a bit more leeway for China to conduct looser policies if it wishes. Right. So so I think the, the, the Chinese economy has structural issues that needs to be ironed out. Right. So between providing support for the developers, restructuring the debt, and then uh, maybe even providing rate cuts more than what is already done, right? So in an environment where US rates are high and dollars strong, it's not that easy for any EF to, to cut rates uh, without being too worried about the FX weakness, right? So, so, so if you think about it this way, then yes, I think, if we go into a soft landing scenario where rates and dollars no longer uh, a big issue, it would be probably a, gives a lot more flexibility for for the PBOC uh, to to try and provide more support to the economy, and which might be sorely needed looking at the data that's been coming out recently. Right. So, so you are basically on the same line with our China team that despite having capital controls in place and a largely closed capital account. Even the PBOC was constrained in 2023 from unleashing massive stimulus, not because of some domestic factors, but because of external factors. Uh, I would say that the PBOC has uh, a lot more autonomy compared to to the other EMs, right? Because of the capital controls. Uh, so it is also due in part to their own stance, right? So I think that they, they, they have been more worried about using uh, the interest rate tools to try and stimulate the economy because there, there have always been fears that they will lead to further bubbles in financial markets, etc. Right. So we have seen that over the past uh, 10, 15 years or so. So they don't want to repeat the same kind of mistake. So judging by the data, uh, I think, uh, and the shift on the external front, I think that they will probably uh be be more more leeway for them to act on the policy front uh so th there could be some pressure and uh, for for them to cut rates uh, subsequently okay let's talk about the um rbi and bi you're not know, the two quote unquote high yield economies of asia which in 2023 did not see massive uh, currency weakness or capital outflow issues but nonetheless you know they had their domestic factors of high inflation they had to tighten monetary policy bi did a surprise hike um, so, given this sort of you know, quasi Goldilocks scenario for 2024, which takes away some of the pressure from emerging markets, would you then be super long Indonesian bonds and Indian bonds? Uh, I think we have to watch for the the levels and then uh, how how this uh, narrative evolves because we've been in Goldilocks for uh, a while for selected assets and for EM assets say the the rupiah and, and for Indogavis, it is only in the more recent few weeks that things have gotten a lot more positive. As you mentioned, uh there there was a hike from, from BI even after quite a few months of pause. And that was when pressure was very acute, right? Because the dollar just kept on strengthening and, and, and then US use across all tenders were extremely high. So under those kind of circumstances it it's arguably more prudent to 
take defensive measures and which BI took. And BI also introduced a host of other instruments to try and uh, draw in uh, foreign funds to try and uh, support the rupiah. But I think the, the big thing here is that the external factors now is considerably more benign. If you look at the, the strength of uh, the, the, the rupiah uh, recently. So I think uh, on balance, yes, I think the entire narrative seems to have shifted and the EM assets uh, would be a lot more interesting, uh, not just for uh, Indo and India, but really broader as a whole. Yes, I think that that is happening. Uh, for, for the RBI, I guess it's just something similar, except that there's a, a lot less volatility on, on the INR. So on the bonds front, it is also a, seems to be a lot less volatile. So it's just a matter of waiting for, for the external conditions to align before, I guess, investors become more, more confident on de deploying funds. Right. Uh, so, of course, you know, some of our listeners might be wondering, we dial into a US dollar webinar and why are we sort of going on a tangent and <laughs> talking about other things? But I guess the main point was that, you know, the corollary from US dollar outlook is substantial uh, for the PBOCs of the world. And basically that issue that uh, whether policy was constrained in 2023 for EMs because of US dollar stance, uh, US Fed stance, and would that then have a salutary impact? That's the sort of, you know, chain of thought that I had. Um, Eugene, going back to the US, it is going to be amazing if we actually pull off a full-fledged soft landing. You don't have 500 basis points of rate hike in a cycle, and then inflation sort of slowly disappears, the economy slowly slows, and then credit risk doesn't really rise too much and everything just goes along. Um, how confident are you of the soft landing scenario? Uh, as you know, you know, and our listeners will find out that that is the key theme for us for our annual outlook, which we're doing next week, which is soft landing with a question mark. So what is the probability on that question mark? Yeah, I think the the odds of soft landing is probably around sixty percent, and hard landing or harder landing than that would probably be twenty thirty percent, and no landing about ten ten percent or so. All right, so I think that's the spread. I think one of the most important thing to 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 get get the pulse on is what is the Fed's stance, right? Is the Fed still going to be overly aggressive at this point, or have they shifted tack? Right, because an overly aggressive Fed at the wrong point in the cycle will trigger a hard landing. Right, because if the cycle is already going down and then the Fed exacerbates it, uh, then yeah, we will get hard landing. But if the cycle is cooling, as we think it is cooling, and the Fed is cognizant of that and is starting to sound less hawkish and this narrative shifts to slightly dovish and deliver say four cuts, uh that would be supportive of the economy. Right? So so we are already seeing some supportive elements kick in. And that's from financial conditions. Right. And if we have rate cuts kicking in at some point next year, that too should support the economy. Because fundamentally there is nothing seriously wrong with the US at this point. It is not like the run up uh, into the GFC where households and banks were overly leveraged. So there might be some other pockets, but it does not seem to be too serious at this point. So, so yeah, soft landing still seems like a reasonable bet. Very good. Excellent. Uh, of course, what that means for credit is the next question, but you are relieved from that answer. Uh, Eugene, let's bring uh, William in. William, go ahead, please. Right. Um, thanks. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, thanks Eugene. I think... Um, there is a very good overview of um, how the U.S. monetary policy cycle has changed. Uh, so for my part, I will discuss three major areas. The first is how have policy change in the U.S. Uh, affected financing for U.S. corporates? Um, have we seen the full pass through uh, in terms of higher interest expense for corporates? If not, what does it mean uh, for profitability across uh, the U.S. sector? Um, the second point I would like to raise um, is also to look at risks that are latent in the uh, U.S. corporate bond space. We have seen um, financial stability risk in the first half of this year, partly due to 
uh, fallout from the SVB. And the question is, could we see a certain a certain kind of replay of this risk uh, going forward, especially with um, uh, with uh, rates uh, still at fairly high levels, even though uh, we we could see up to four rate cuts next year. And the last point I would like to uh, explain is how our outlook for credit markets are. Um, which sectors do we like? Uh, which sectors do we think can have some scope for our performance? Um, so moving on to the next slide. So as you can see, um, the U.S. interest, corporate interest expense is very closely linked uh, to the monetary policy stance. And it's also very closely linked to how the U.S. 10-year use Evolve. So it tends to be in an average of the Fed funds rates and the 10-year U. And we are seeing that over time, um, given the downtrend in the 10-year U, um, U.S. corporate's interest expense, uh, which we have expressed here as a percent of liabilities on an annual basis, um, has been steadily falling since 2007. Um, in fact, the decline accelerated even more after the pandemic uh, with 10-year U hitting close to its record low. So the question has becomes now that with interest rates rising again, uh, with 10-year yields back towards 4 or 5%, um, what does it mean actually for the financing um, rates of uh, US corporates? So as you can see, actually it has risen, uh, but not to the same extent as um, the 10-year yield or the Fed funds rates. And the reason is simple, because um, corporates generally lock in uh, borrowing rates uh, when they issue um, longer term bonds, they don't borrow at overnight rates. And since the pandemic, actually, companies have been lengthening uh, the tenor of uh, bonds uh, that they, they have uh, issued in the market. So that means that the duration of the outstanding corporate bonds have actually risen significantly uh, in the pandemic years compared to uh, from 2014 to 2020. So that explains why there's a slow pass through in terms of um, the uh, interest expense being paid by corporates. Um, but it also means that we are not past the worst stage of a rise in interest expense. Uh, so monetary policy operates with long and variable lags. Uh, we are still in the very early innings when uh, corporate expense, corporate interest expense is rising because they are coming to the market um, to, to, to uh, reissue bonds uh, for their maturing debt. So we do expect some steady increase in the U.S. interest expense, perhaps up to 4%, uh, more or less in line with the highs that we've seen back in uh, 20, uh, 2004, uh, when, when the U.S. 10-year U and Fed funds rate were very similar to current levels. Um, so definitely, this is going to be a, a, a hit win for U.S. credit. Um, next slide. So. One aspect that we want to look at is also how have uh, credit demand been changing due to the high interest rates environment. So uh, we break it down into two aspects. The first, we look directly at the loans uh, across US banks. And it's very clear uh, that loans growth has slowed very significantly since the Fed began to hike interest rates. So on a quarter on quarter basis, uh, we have seen uh, loan growth peak sometime in um, late 2022 and has come off fairly sharply uh, since then. Uh, this is much lower than the average loan growth rate that we've seen back from 2013 to 2020. So credit demand definitely has been impacted by high rates. On the issuance side, um, we also see a very similar picture uh, in terms of net issuance. Uh, back in uh, 2020, during the pandemic, we see a very huge upswing in net issuance. Uh, given that companies were short of cash uh, and yields were very low. But, but as 10-year yields gradually increase, that means that the price of borrowing or uh, tapping the corporate bond market has been increasing steadily. Uh, this has resulted in very much less uh, appetite to tap bond markets. Uh, we see net issuance uh, falling quite significantly. So the second half of 2022 was a bit of a special case because of very high volatility. Uh, but even as of uh, now, where credit spreads are fairly benign, uh, we still see very low amount of issuance activity compared to where uh, things stand back in 20, 2019, uh, 2020. So definitely credit demand and supply 
uh, in the corporate bond market has changed. Um, companies are a lot more reluctant to tap markets at this time. So um, what does that mean in, uh, in totality in terms of the risk that US corporates will face? Um, so the next slide, uh, we explain a little bit about the global credit environment as well. Uh, so it's not just the case that the US is a special case where issuance has fallen. Uh, we've seen issuance um, slow quite significantly, uh, not just uh, for China where there are persistent concerns over um, property sector, concerns over LGFE, but even in Eurozone, uh, given that ECB has been hiking rates, um, the amount of issuance activity uh, has so, so somewhat um, normalized over time. So in fact, if you look at this, uh, things on a net issuance basis uh, for the second half of 2023, uh, issuance is perhaps the lowest we've we'll seen uh, since, um, the, uh, since the uh, pandemic began, um, except for the period of time in uh, second half 2022. Um, of course, there will be some relief uh, pent out issuance uh, as used narrow, but over time, but on, on aggregate, we think that uh, supply would probably still be positive uh, for corporate bonds uh, in the sense that uh, we won't see as much issuance activity uh, as we've seen uh, during the um, earlier uh, pandemic years. So all this ties up to actually higher risk. Uh, if you look at our next slide, we, we talk a bit uh, about how defaults uh, have uh, risen. If you see from 2021, back then uh, defaults fell to a record low um, and subsequently it has been normalizing back um, since then. Uh, part of it is due to higher interest expense. Um, that means that a lot more companies have turned cash flow negative uh, and they could also find it harder to tap corporate bond markets um, given that um, uh, that rates have uh, moved out quite significantly. So if you look at the long-term uh, average default rate in the US market, it's about 3.9%. So that level has been breached uh, in the first half of 2023 with the failure of SVB. Uh, we think that there's probably some scope for further increase in default rates uh, to come through in the US market, even though uh, the Fed has successfully stemmed uh, the rash of bank failures. Uh, if you look at the rating changes in the U.S. corporate bond market, for instance, you can see that downgrades have been outpacing upgrades um, since uh, late 2021. Uh, that suggests that profitability, um, operating cash flow metrics, uh, leverage, this, this metrics have been deteriorating uh, in the U.S. Uh, credit sector. Um, probably in, that's also indicative that we could see uh, a slow climb in defaults to come through uh into 2024. Uh, next slide. So one of the major issues for this year was actually the failure of uh, US banks. Uh, we, we saw um, SVB suffering a bank run. We saw um, Credit Suisse, First Republic, Credit Suisse subsequently getting into trouble of their own. Um, so to some extent I would say um, the liquidity risks uh, faced by banks have been quite adequately addressed by the Fed. So it's not just um, expansion of the discount window, uh, but they have introduced the bank term funding program uh, to provide very generous terms uh, for banks um, to, to, to get financing uh, given their holdings of uh, US Treasury. So remember that one of course uh, for bank run was a huge amount of concern over uh, the over, over losses, banks' uh, losses that were uh, not necessarily marked to market uh, on their health to maturity security. So uh, that triggered a bit of concern over uh, the financial viability of banks. Um, so even if there is still lingering concern on the treasury holdings of banks and potential marked to market losses, um, we think that um, the BTFP facility serves a very important pur purpose in terms of providing uh, elastic amount of liquidity, as much liquidity as banks need, even if they uh, suffer from a temporary loss of confidence. Uh, so with that, we don't see any any uh, severe risk of uh, 
of a of a deposit run for U.S. banks. We don't necessarily see uh, financial uh, stability risk coming through again, uh, but probably there could still be some issues with U.S. banks. So what are these issues? Um, this relates to more of fundamentals uh, changes in the market rather than um, a crisis of confidence. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, I think it's quite clear that because of the pandemic, demand for office space, demand for commercial real estate, this has changed in a very uh, significant way. So most of us are working from home. Uh, that means that companies' demand for office space have changed. They have uh, fallen significantly. If you look at the US office property vacancy rate, uh, this chart is from COSA. Um, you can see that there's a huge climb in the amount of property vacancy rate, uh, not just in cities where there has been some, um, where there have been uh, concerns of uh, uh, of uh, excessive supply, but it's also pretty much across the board. So the amount of um, office property vacancy rate in the US is now standing at its highest um, on the record, at least since the 1990s. Um, the good news is this has not necessarily translated into um, high uh, loan delinquency rates. So if you look at delinquency rates across uh, commercial real estate, uh, they remain fairly low, uh, fairly contained. But of course, um, part of it could be due to the fact that uh, the, the, um, the, the landlords, they have not gone back to market to tap financing. They're still pretty much on uh, lower interest rates uh, 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 that they have locked in um, in, in previous years. So uh, the key question is when their loans begin to mature, uh, when they have to go back to the market and refinance, can they afford to do so uh, with this amount of vacancy, with this degree of vacancy rate in the US uh, commercial property market? So I think that's a latent risk. Uh, so from that perspective, um, not all US banks um, will see the same fallout. So in our uh, in terms of the data, we see that smaller U.S. banks, they are a lot more exposed to commercial real estate uh, than the large and super regional. So uh, from that perspective, risk probably will lie more towards uh, the small uh, U.S. Uh, city banks uh, than, than uh, large banks. So, so some degree of caution is probably still warranted uh, in the financial stability space, um, at least, at least um, at least from from perspective of uh, credit quality and from the perspective of loan quality. Um, next slide. So finally, I'll touch on um, what's happening in the credit markets and uh, also go through a bit in terms of the sectoral uh, outlook and which sectors that we, we like or not. Um, so as you can see in this chart, um, the average the average um, credit spreads for U.S. investment grade and high yield credit they have um, stated uh, they, have, they have climbed a little bit from the lows back in 2021, but they're not necessarily particularly high. Uh, they're kind of in the middle of range across uh, uh, the last decade. Uh, so I would say credit conditions are still fairly benign. Uh, if you look at spreads on a year-to-date basis, they have actually narrowed quite significantly. Um, compared to the end of 2022. Uh, back then, financial market volatility was very high. Uh, markets were worried about US recession. Uh, obviously, this year, is more, uh, there's more uh, consensus around soft landing. So from that perspective, um, some narrowing of credit spreads uh, is expected, and we see pretty much every sector uh, have seen spreads come off uh, since then, with the exception of the financial subordinated debt. So that's more or less uh, related to the financial stability risk that I mentioned earlier, uh, and, so, and uh, I guess a degree of risk premium being priced in uh, for that. Um, but going forward, if we, uh, we do see um, slowing US growth to pose some headwinds uh, for credit. So from that perspective, consumer discretionary sector might um, see a bit more uh, of, of, of um, fallout from there, uh, given that consumers, they have to, um, they have to be um, uh, tightening their wallets. Yeah, they're a bit more uh, concerned about uh, labor markets. Their income growth might slow uh, going to 2024. So all this perhaps point to 
I think, a smaller degree of profitability for, for that particular sector. Um, the other sector we think could be a bit more affected is the industrial sector. Uh, industrials typically have much higher beta to the economic cycle, um, but there is a sub-segment of industrials that we like. Um, so I'll touch on that uh, in the subsequent uh, slides. So which sectors uh, do we think investors can position in? I think um, the utility sector is perhaps one, uh, primarily because uh, they're, they're considered to be more stable. Uh, their earnings and operating cash flows are a lot less impacted by uh, changes in the economic cycle. Um, but the second reason why we're a bit more positive on US utilities, uh, I will go through on the next slide, uh, which is that the US have introduced legislation that um, would perhaps provide uh, some degree of financial um, incentives for utilities. Uh, this is the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, it provides a lot of tax credits, uh, loan subsidies uh, to enable an energy transition away from fossil fuels um, towards um, more renewable energy generation uh, and always also towards more electrification. So from the structural perspective, um, the demand for electricity uh, is likely to keep uh, rising uh, as, as consumers switch away from fossil fuel vehicles towards EVs. Uh, that naturally implies that utilities could benefit a little bit more from that. Uh, but not only that, you have um, the investment tax and production tax credits for this renewable energy pro projects. And they are fairly significant uh, at about 6% uh, of project cost. So that's a pretty significant subsidy uh, for utilities looking to embark on investments um, in renewable energies. And um, on top of that, there, there's up to 3.6 billion uh, subsidy uh, for up to uh, 40 billion of loans uh, to, 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 for projects that qualify as, as a innovative technology. So what does that include? Uh, as I mentioned, you include renewable energy systems, but even the old fossil fuel technology, as long as they are more efficient than the previous generation, uh, they could benefit and from this uh, loan subsidy as well. Uh, also, electrical generation, transmission, distribution, uh, technologies, investments, all this can benefit uh, from, from, from this uh, loan subsidy. So, uh, in a nutshell, the utility sector uh, is likely to see a little bit more tailwinds uh, given the legislative changes that have been enacted uh, at the start of 2023. Um, the next slide. And I've mentioned that there is a subsegment of industrials that we think uh, could benefit uh, as well. Uh, and it's also a bit more immune to cyclical change, uh, cycl to, to the economic cycle, and that's the defense related industrials. Um, so, one important thing to note is that the, the geopolitical uncertainty in today's world is a lot more. Uh, numerous, uh, a lot more complicated than what we've seen, uh, I guess, since the, uh, the the start of the US war on terror. So if you see US military expenditure changes over the last 40 years, um, they have generally been uh, declining uh, when certain uh, geopolitical uh, events happen. So back in the 1990s, when the USSR was dissolved, uh, we see a bit of a decline in the US real military spending. Uh, in 2011, when uh, Osama bin Laden was killed, uh, there was also another decline uh, in US military expenditure. But um, now with the uh, Russia-Ukraine war in 2022, uh, with the Israel-Hamas uh, conflict in the Middle East, uh, with a lot of uncertainty, I guess, even in East Asia, um, probably we would not be seeing any substantial decline in US military spending. On the converse, we could even see a bit of a rebound or recovery towards the previous peak uh, in back in 2011. Uh, military expenditure um, could continue to rise uh, given the, the wide range of geopolitical challenges uh, faced by the US um, in today's world. Um, so. So this is why um, uh, we, we, we see industrials um, 
defense related industrial as being a, a positive uh, seg uh, segment where there could still be a certain degree of uh, compression and stress. Um, on a broader basis, I think the industrial sector segment uh, has seen uh, certain changes that could raise the risk of default. So if you look at, for instance, the amount of um, short-term liabilities out by um, uh, faced by uh, U.S. manufacturing corporations. So this this have risen uh, quite a bit from 2020. Uh, partly, as I mentioned, uh, long-term loans or long-term bonds uh, get closer to maturity, uh, and they are not necessarily uh, financed at high rates. Uh, that means that the overall financing structure has changed uh, towards a more short-term nature. Uh, compared to uh, pre-pandemic years. Uh, the second thing is that the amount of cash that companies are holding now is also a lot less than what uh, they were back in 2020. So 2020, even though the um, growth cycle, uh, the growth, uh, US growth was particularly, was 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 very much uh, hit by COVID-related uh, disruptions, uh, we didn't really see very significant defaults in the US industrial space, and that's par partly because cash holdings are quite high. But now we've seen a bit of a normalization in cash holdings. So the gap between liabilities and cash, that has widened out. So in 2020, the gap was really at its lowest uh, over, a lot, over the last 20 years, but this gap has since widened up back towards um, around 28% to 30% of total liabilities. Well, that's more or less in line uh, with um, the average across 2010 to 2020. Uh, that also implies we could see a uh, consequent rise in defaults, especially among um, industrial companies, um, given the fact that they have to, um, uh, to face a higher uh, a, a war of uh, maturing short-term debt uh, in the next year or so. Um, so I think that is uh, that rounds out my presentation. So I'll be happy to um, to take questions um, from from the floor or from um, from any of the uh, participants as well. Right. Uh, so the chat box remains open for everybody. Uh, I would love to have any questions on sectors that William has talked about, or any particular sort of spillover from the rate story that Eugene painted and its implication for various uh, credit related developments that uh, William talked about. So while we wait for the questions, we have about six minutes. Uh, William, in terms of um, credit spreads, at no point during this rate hike cycle did we see credit spreads spike, which is really unusual because you think that the market would try to differentiate between good and bad credit in a proactive manner when rates go up. This was the complaint during QE and low rates that you know you cannot really distinguish between good and bad credit um, because everything is so bunched together at the low end of the interest rate spectrum. Now we have Fed funds rate at five and a half. There should be ample opportunity for the market to separate the A's from the B's and the C's. And still, uh, we've just seen a bit of a shift in the credit spectrum, not a massive widening of spreads here and there. Does it go back to Eugene's point that, you know, everybody has got a sound balance sheet, everybody's deleveraged and nothing to worry about? Yeah, so I guess that goes back to a point where monetary policy acts uh, with a very long lag, right? So uh, even though the marginal rates of borrowing have increased so dramatically over the last uh, last year, but if you look at the actual interest expense being paid by US companies, they remain uh, very low. They have been rising, of, of course, but not to the same extent as interest rates. Uh, so that means that the, um, the cash flows uh, metrics have not necessarily deteriorated very much. Uh, so I think, I guess markets are seeing um, the fact that um, the, 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 the cash flows changes for companies, especially those companies that have very high um, uh, liability duration, uh, they are probably a bit more immune to short-term volatility in rates. So I guess that's one reason why uh, the markets have not been too worried about defaults. Uh, and that has also been borne out of the data. If you look at the actual defaults uh, rate that has come through in US, in, for US corporates, they have remained fairly low, rising from um, nearly 1% to just around 3, 3, 3.5%, but they're still pretty much across, they're still pretty much 
um, lower than what we've seen uh, in previous cycles. So, um, um, so, so I think to some extent, uh, the lengthening of liability duration has played a role in it. Um, to, to another extent, the downswing uh, in US growth uh, has not been too sharp. In fact, if you look at um, growth in Q3, it was pretty good. It was about 5%. Um, very, yeah, very even Q4 growth because... right now on track to be over 2%. Yeah. Exactly. So it's, it's very um, difficult um, to just um, say that because rates are high, we could see uh, increased defaults when when actually growth is, is holding up pretty well. So uh, it goes back to a soft landing scenario. Um, growth. No, no. Well, yeah, it's Eugene's no landing scenario. No landing scenario. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, okay, good, good. And I hear you. Uh, I, I always get nervous when we struggle to find chance of things getting tripped over because that's when it happens. Before the SBV thing happened, you know, whether it was the San Francisco Fed regulators or the Federal Reserve in Washington DC regulators. It, with hindsight, it seems so obvious that we should have kept an eye on it and we should have known that a bank collapse was coming, but ex ante, everybody was relaxed, right? So, I mean, uh, thanks to both of you. I mean, look, I mean, I understand that from a fundamentals perspective, from a metrics perspective, from a, you know, leading indicators perspective, things are looking remarkably good. I get nervous when everything looks good. But maybe I'm just getting nervous way too much. Maybe I just relax. And uh, thanks to your analysis, we'll end the year on a high note and take the question mark away from the soft landing narrative and just say soft landing, period. So with that, I think um, we will end today's webinars. So thanks to everybody for dialing in. Uh, we have our annual outlook next Tuesday, not a WebEx event. So only for those who are attending, uh, but we will make the recording available. So until then, everybody, take care and stay healthy. Bye-bye.